Prior to 1920, the Royal Engineers provided line communication throughout the army, and that was cables spread across the ground with telephones on either end. It was then realised that we needed a core of signals to provide this communication system. So in 1920, the Royal Corps of Signals were formed. We came up with the idea of 100 pictures. And the idea being that we produce art boxes that people can record with their own personal impression or memory of something that's happened over their time in service. These are the people who've got the memories of what has been. And it could be a memory of the barracks, it could be a memory of being away on exercise, it could be a memory of being on tour and how they felt when they were away from their family. We are marking the 100th year with our own event, with our own people. This only happens once, it will never happen again. I was originally born in Grimsby on the East Coast. The, the choice of, as a boy was to go to sea, uh, and I took one trip on a trawler to uh, Iceland where I was a cabin boy. The boat didn't just go up and down, it also rocked from side to side, and that motion proved to me that I don't want to be at sea. So I decided to join the army, and the next thing I know, I was at Harrogate Station being shouted at, waiting to go into the Apprentice College. I was 16 and a half. I wasn't old enough to drink, I always remember that. And we weren't allowed to drink, formerly weren't allowed to drink. One of my earliest recollections of military uniform is having to shave the shirt when we first got them from the stores because they used to itch so much. Or how we would buy tins and tins of starch to starch our trousers to put a crease in. In the days before email or mobile phones, every Friday night we would have to sit outside our room and write letters to our parents. That was how you communicated. And hope that the next week you'd have a letter back to tell you that they're still interested in what you're doing. So I was 16 and a half. And in three days time, I'm 62. And still wearing uniform. My team now has started to put together boxes of artist materials. Once we've packed them, we then ship them out to people who are interested in taking part of our exhibition, and then, then hopefully they'll complete a nice picture for us so that we can then display on the online gallery. I took a box home for my kids, maybe a picture of me and mum that served in the Royal Signals. They might just draw something or something relating to my time in the army and especially within the Royal Corps of Signals. It'll bring back memories, it'll be of everybody who's been involved in the army, not just the signals. Everybody has got a memory. And I suppose if you look at the art exhibition in Kirby and see a razor and a furry shirt, but no name, you might know who just put that in there. Over the past couple of months, we've managed to gather pictures, prose, information and background on various veterans who wanted to take part in Picturing 100. Those are now in the Kirby Gallery. One of the pieces of artwork that came into picturing 100 was from Padre Mike Newman. Mike was the Padre of 33 Signal Regiment up until his disbandment in 1999. Padre Mike Newman was inspired to become a Padre, having read the life and works of the Reverend Studdart Kennedy, who won the Military Cross during the First World War. 
He was known as Woodbine Willie because one of his treats was to pass around Woodbine cigarettes throughout the troops on the ground. Reverend Studdard died in 1929 in Liverpool. The work that he did convinced Padre Mike that he too should also take up the ministry. One of the examples of the work that came in is from Holly Ford, who is age 10. It's called My Grandad. My Grandad is my best mate. He tells me stories that are great. He talks to me about the war and how we completed in the Iraq and Afghan tours. He has seven medals, which makes me so proud. I'd like to shout this out loud. But my Grandad is a quiet man, you see. I'm just glad he safely made it home to tell me. And this here is Grandad. Grandad is actually W01 Steve Jolliffe. And the picture here shows him showing a young Iraqi child his rifle in 2005. This picture shows a rainbow surrounding her family and the lovely words that say, you gave up your tomorrow so we could have our today. A lovely sentiment. This is combat body armor. This is the desert pattern version. It weighs around eight to 10 kilograms, uh, dry weight. It also absorbs water. So once wet, it obviously gets heavier. They mainly come with two pieces of ballistic plate. One is in the front over the heart and the second piece is in the rear at the center of the back. These are designed to absorb a bullet coming at you or to stop shrapnel also penetrating. It's like most things really. Uh, putting the armour on, first of all, is quite a difficult struggle. But once you got used to wearing it, you just get used to wearing it. Uh, add to that a weapon and your webbing, and then suddenly you realise that it's not as easy to move around as you thought it would be. And it still smells even now. If you want to just... That's a definite smell of sweat. That's what they smell of. Uh, they're heavy, uncomfortable. They attract water. Once they get wet, they get laden as well. But it is very uncomfortable. This piece of artwork came in from a major, Eddie Hampson, who joined the Royal Corps of Signals in 1959. He's from Liverpool, he's a local boy with a local strong Scouse accent. And he's took a long time trying to be taught by his soldiers around him how to break down the barriers of his accent. In 1958, I was a 20 year old, newly qualified engineer working for the General Post Office. I had recently completed my apprenticeship and looking forward to earning a lot more majors. I had, however, forgotten about national conscription. The government decided to reduce the level of national service 
and so were calling up only those who had, for some reason, been deferred. I had been deferred during my apprenticeship. In April 1959, I, along with 300 others, reported to Catrick Camp in Yorkshire to start my military training. Training included marching, cleaning, a lot of shouting and some lectures. One lecture was on how our careers might progress after basic training. We would all be interviewed individually and we could tell the interviewing officer what trade we wanted to follow. I have no idea why, but I decided to attempt to become an officer. Twelve of the intake were immediately transferred to the squadron that dealt with officer recruits and after more training tests and interviews, finally we were posted to Mons Officer Cadet School in Aldershot. In the first month, I was given the duty of being a pay witness. We were paid weekly, and two cadets were assigned as witnesses. One would read out the amount for each cadet from the payrolls, and the other would witness the paying officer, who wrote down the correct figure in the pay book. I was assigned to reading out the amounts. After around 40 minutes, I was relieved from duty, and was the next day put in front of the squadron commander, who told me that the paying officer had complained that he could not understand my accent. Now, having lived in Liverpool all my life, I really didn't know that I had an accent, never mind one that the others couldn't understand. The squadron commander explained that if others could not understand what I was saying, then I would not get qualified as a commissioned officer. So, if I wished to remain in training at Mons, I would have to lose my accent. He said that I would be given one month to improve to a point where I could be easily understood. I was devastated and at a total loss about how I could achieve this. For the next month, I learned what comradeship and friends meant. Wherever I went or whatever I did, I was accompanied by other members of the platoon who would correct my speech, especially with words like book and cook, which became book and cook. They also reminded me to reduce the guttural sound of K in so many words. Others would show me which knife to use when faced with full place settings, how to eat spaghetti, or even to peel a grapefruit for breakfast. It was all done with a great pleasure and kindness, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. The problem was never mentioned by the powers that be. I did, however, develop something of an inferiority complex until the Beatles came along and made the Scouse accent fashionable. There are very few veterans alive today who will remember wearing the Brodie helmet. This version from the First World War moves all the way through service up till around the 1970s. I too remember wearing this style of helmet, a very uncomfortable steel helmet, and also incorporated what was called a spider on the inside, which was designed to stop your head getting spiked from the inside of the helmet. Thankfully, those helmets were replaced. And in the early 80s, the Mark VI helmet came into service such as this, which is made from ballistic material. For the first time, it became comfortable to wear. It incorporated a mesh interior. The front of the helmet had a padding as well, which stopped it chafing across the front of your head. But most importantly, it was designed with cutouts on the inside, which enabled you to wear headsets from the Klansman radio, which was just coming into service in the early 1980s. This soldier of the First World War wears a white over blue armband, which shows that he's a communicator. In the field, you don't know what regiment somebody's with. You can't tell them all across signals. But my flash on my arm is a blue and white, and people in the army know that signals. So you go to the flash, and these are called tactical recognition flashes. And they've been in existence since the First World War. We carry on the tradition. One of the earliest examples of communications equipment I have is what we call a heliograph. Heliograph started to come into common use around the mid to late 1800s 
This example dates back from the First World War. It's a very simple device to use. By pulsing the button on the back, you reflect the sun on or off to the receiver, therefore sending a message. It's recorded that on a good day with bright sunlight, a heliograph could communicate over 50 miles. And unless you were in the line of sight of the heliograph, nobody else could read that message. So the heliograph was the WhatsApp as of its time because nobody else could read what you're saying unless you were in that group. One of the oldest pieces of technology I've got here is a telephone exchange from 1917. And it would bring 16 telephone lines into an exchange where an exchange operator could then patch out each telephone line to another telephone in the field somewhere in Northern Europe. The biggest problem was the fact that the line would get cut and snapped. That was the problem. It only took a shell nearby to sever the lines. You've lost communications. And the line layers and cable layers of that time were particularly hardened men who knew if the line went, it was their responsibility to reconnect that line. Not every piece of work that came in for the project was a drawing or a painting. A good example is from Terry Robinson, MBE. Now Terry, I've known for a long time, and he's 89 years old, and he decided that he would create a scrapbook. And it records his service between 1949 and 51, when he was posted to Malaysia. It shows the boats he moved across to Malaysia in. It also shows you 180 pound tents that I'm sure many of the veterans will remember with some glee or disdain. We're still in service in 1975, and once wet, these weighed a lot more than 180 pounds, that's for sure. This picture shows the Sando blocks in Catrick, which many of the veterans may well recall. One of the great images here is of Terry as a young man, sat with a Morse key in his left hand, operating a wireless net back to the headquarters. This is a 24-hour ration pack, and it's designed to sustain a soldier in the field or on operations for a period of 24 hours. It comprises of a breakfast, a lunch, and an evening meal. This one, for example, holds curry chicken and potatoes, a Thai-style chicken soup, and for a dessert, a sticky toffee pudding. The difference between these rations of today to the rations of old is the rations of old were all in tins. A tin was placed in hot water, uh, the old mess tins that we used to have, and then boiled for about 20 or 30 minutes. Chewing gum, a bit of Americanism. During the Gulf War, we would often trade our rations to the Americans because they produced a thing called MRE, which was meals ready to eat. It was a bit like watching American TV and eating hot dogs, uh, whereas we would have a standard of uh, cheese possessed. Uh, and the well-known one, which was steak and kidney pudding, which was commonly known as baby's heads. So it was often traded in between the detachments in the desert.
but we're also very lucky to have these examples that came in from David D'Souza, who's an artist based in Manchester. The paintings here depict scenes from the First World War, ranging down to Northern Ireland. One of the things you'll always notice through David's paintings is his use of the image of the poppy. I deployed to the first Gulf War from Germany and we deployed a trunk system called Ptarmigan. It provided digital communications on the ground. It broke down to a fax machine, a telephone system, a computer system and a telegraph system and was used until the mid 90s. This also was used in the first Gulf War. We were now taking it into the battlefield in a digital scenario. One of the major things I remember from the Gulf War is being able to make the telephone call back to my wife. Something I'd never done before. Suddenly I was in the, the Gulf, the Arabian Gulf, about to start a war, but I could pick a telephone up and suddenly talk to my family. The ability to make that phone call home in you know, the early 1990s from the middle of the desert was a huge leap in faith and would argue be one of the first types of mobile phone system that we would understand to be a mobile network. The subsection of Ptarmigan that we call single channel radio access produced the mobile phone that we use now. So our expertise goes from a line on the ground to a mobile phone and everything in between. Another example of some of the work that came in for the project came from Tony Mullen. Tony is part of the Raw Signals Association in Liverpool. Tony has managed to document not only his service as a boy and when he first joined in 1961, but also the service of his father when he joined up, his paternal grandfather from many years ago, his uncle Bill, who served in India as the RSM of the Liverpool Scottish Cameronians. And not only that, but also his maternal grandfather was also a member of the armed forces, which shows this lineage that goes back through time, through families. Many veterans will have this similar type of lineage. My father was in the army and he was a Royal Engineer, um, which interestingly is where the Royal Corps of Singles came from. The sad thing I remember is him not being there when I was finally commissioned from Sandhurst. I went from a boy in a council estate to leave in Sandhurst and my father wasn't there. But for me, that's the saddest event that I have. Um, my father not being around you know, when, when it happened. One of the great things that this project has enabled us to do is to draw a direct connection between ourselves in 33 Signal Squadron and the veterans of old. This trophy was presented in 1902 to the then South Lancashire Regiment by BICC, a well-known employer in Prescott around that time. And we're very proud to hold this trophy still in our collection in the barracks in Heighton. And we were very lucky to find this picture of servicemen dressed in the uniform of the early 1900s. This trophy in the centre, it looks exactly the same as this trophy here, because it is that trophy, showing almost 118 years of continuity.
the serviceman of today is the veteran of tomorrow. So to enable that serviceman today to understand there is a whole organisation of veterans out there who can help support them is extremely important. We've also managed to get veterans communicating and talking to other veterans again. You make friends in the armed forces that you keep for life. The sense of camaraderie, the friendship, the experiences that you have. So we keep that connection with our veterans and their families as tight as possible. You never stop serving in the army. You just stop wearing a uniform.